All right, welcome back. We are talking about water now. This is part two of chemistry. Uh, I wanted to start with this picture just to reiterate the importance of the ability of water molecules to hydrogen bond. Um, it is the ability of water to hydrogen bond and its somewhat unique structure that give it some of the properties that make it probably one of the most special molecules on the planet. Um, and I should also, let me reiterate the difference between an atom and a molecule, because I think it sometimes gets lost on people, right? Hydrogen, atom. Oxygen, atom. If you put two or more atoms together, you have a molecule. So covalent bonds are the bonds that hold molecules together. And then hydrogen bonds are bonds that happen between molecules, or as we saw here, sometimes between different parts of a molecule. Um, but so because of hydrogen's ability to hydrogen bond so well and with so many different species or different compounds because it can form hydrogen bonds with negative charges and hydrogen bonds with positive charges, it makes it a really good solvent. Um, and because it can hydrogen bond with itself, it gives it some unique properties. Uh, and one property that we don't talk about is the fact that, um, and I'll be quick, water is the only substance I know of that expands when it freezes. Usually as things get colder, molecules move slower, um, they pack closer together, and they get denser. But because when water freezes, it is encouraged to hydrogen bond with itself, it forms this more crystalline structure as opposed to water molecules more loosely organized in the water. And so when that happens and it firms up and freezes, it forms this crystalline lattice. And this is why water expands when it freezes, which no other liquid on the planet does. And it's really important because if water got dense when it froze, if it shrunk, um, then the water on top of a lake would freeze and sink to the bottom, and then more water on top would freeze and sink to the bottom. Uh, and bodies of water that froze would, would freeze solid potentially over the winter. Um, so it's not just an interesting, interesting fact that's important. But sorry, we're going to move on to what is important for us. Um, so the reason why water is important is that it's everywhere in all of your cells and outside of all of your cells. Um, so pretty much every part of your body except for, say, your lungs is filled with some sort of watery substance. Um, it has five different properties. Um, this used to be an essay question. I am not doing essay questions for this online class. Um, but for each of these, what you want to do is know what the property means, know what it means to have a high heat capacity or a high heat of vaporization, and then know how that benefits the body. So it's really two pieces of information for each of those properties. Um, and I would ask questions about, you know, which property of the water um, allows it to transport substances around your body and you would say excellent solvent or something like that. Um, so then first up then is the high heat capacity. What this means is that you can dump a lot of energy, heat, into water without it changing its temperature. Um, so the classic example is a watched pot never boils, right? So you put on your water for coffee or tea in the morning, and it seems to take forever for the water to heat up. That's its high heat capacity. Conversely, once it has been heated up, it holds on to that heat. So it doesn't change temperature very easy because you put a lot of heat in there to get it hot. It has to lose a lot of heat before it cools down. So this is why if you pick up coffee at McDonald's, and at the restaurant, it's like lava. You can't even get it near your mouth. 15 minutes later, you're in the car, you're still driving. It's still pretty darn hot um, because water doesn't heat up or cool down very fast. What this means for you is that it keeps your body temperature stable. Um, so if you go outside on a hot day, you don't heat up real quick. 
or if you go outside on a cool day, you don't cool down real quick. It just add, it acts as a heat reservoir so that your body temperature doesn't change drastically. Um, high heat of vaporization is very similar to high heat capacity, but a little bit different. Um, so there is a special amount of energy that has to take place to get elements or compounds, I should say water is a compound, um, to get compounds to change phase from liquid to solid or solid to gas. Um, so it takes a certain amount of energy to get water from 99 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. It takes a lot more energy to get water molecules at 100 degrees Celsius to become water vapor at 100 degrees Celsius. This is why steam is so dangerous. It's got all that excess energy in it. Um, so when water does evaporate, it takes all of that heat with us. Um, and because our sweat contains a lot of water, when it evaporates, it cools us down. And this makes sweating a very effective way for us to regulate our body temperature. Sorry, I'm drinking coffee while I'm doing this. That's so rude. Uh, and just to give you an example, I'll try not to belabor the point too long. Uh, being able to sweat is one of humankind's greatest biological adaptations. Um, we sweat better than a lot of other animals out there, and that makes us pretty much the king or queen, whatever, the best long-distance runners on the planet. Um, Right, so most other animals or many other animals are going to be able to run us down like a crocodile or an alligator or a bear. They're faster than us, um, but given enough time, we're going to be able to run farther. They are going to overheat and fatigue quicker than we will because we have the ability to sweat. Um, and it is one of our advantages. It's why sort of we are capable or we're capable of leading the nomadic lifestyle we led because we could just cover so much ground every day without overheating. Next up, um, water is highly reactive. Um, this is very important. Um, so water you are going to see um, is also a solvent. So it is good at holding liquids or not liquids, holding solutes or other compounds in suspension. But in addition to just being a place where chemistry happens, water participates in your body's chemistry. And we are going to have two chemical reactions that demonstrate this, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. Um, cushioning is not a big deal. Just know that water is kind of a cushion. Uh, we'll skip that one. Then water also happens to be the universal solvent. Um, again, because of its ability to hydrogen bond and its ability to hydrogen bond with both positively charged particles and negatively charged particles, it can dissolve or hold in solution a whole lot of different substances. This has two very important um, consequences for your body. The first is that it says here it facilitates the body's chemistry. Um, so what you want to think of when you're looking at this is think of a chemistry lab. And chemistry labs have lots of beakers and flasks and graduated cylinders. Right? You don't usually see a chemist mixing two powders together to get a reaction to happen. It's usually two liquids. Um, so things that dissolve in water usually are then much more likely to react with other things dissolved in the water. So there are a lot of reactions that take place in your body that would not take place if the participants in that reaction were not in an aqueous solution. Um, so it's hugely important. So taken together, this one here and this one here, right, mean water is not only a great place for chemistry to happen, but water participates in the chemistry. So it is a huge region why, reason why our physiology works the way it does. And then also, right, because water can transport things and it's relatively easy to transport water, 
that makes it our body's major transport medium. So many of your nutrients and waste products are dissolved in water and to your bloodstream and then the blood is distributed around the body and that's how nutrients get from one area to another and it's also through processes of processing water that your kidneys use to extract waste. Um, so it being a solvent means it facilitates chemistry and acts as a transport medium. Like think how hard it would be if your body had to transport solid chunks of protein and sugar around your body. But dissolved sugar and amino acids can just float along in your bloodstream. Um, definitions. These are two very important definitions. Uh, we will talk more about them later on once we talk about the cell and other bits of chemistry. Um, so hydrophilic literally means water loving. Any molecules that are hydrophilic are polar, um, which means they have the ability to hydrogen bond. And if you can hydrogen bond, then you will mix with water. Hydrophobic literally means water fearing. Um, these molecules are nonpolar, so they cannot hydrogen bond and are usually then excluded by water. So this is like oil. This is why the oil and vinegar in your salad dressing separate. And it's not really that the nonpolar molecules are afraid of water. They don't really care. It's just that water molecules don't want to be next to a hydrophobic molecule because they can't hydrogen bond with it. So when the two try and mix, the water molecules all join hands next to each other and exclude the poor hydrophobic nonpolar molecules because they can't hydrogen bond. Uh, next up is different kinds of mixtures. Uh, don't worry about the definition of a mixture. I'm not going to ask you about that. Um, and we're going to do this quick because it's not terribly important. Um, so you have colloids and suspensions. The big difference between the two is that in a colloid, there are large particles of solute. So this is otherwise solid particles that are floating around in a liquid but they do not settle out. They remain mixed within the colloid. Milk is an example of that. So there are proteins and fat particles that just mix around and they stay um, up in the liquid or the solvent. With a suspension, um, it's similar in that you have a mixture of some sort of liquid and large particles but these particles tend to settle out and the example of that in your body is your bloodstream um, where the plasma is the liquid portion and your red blood cells and white blood cells are suspended in the plasma but if you let it sit long enough or spin them down in the centrifuge the heavier white and red blood cells will settle out of suspension then you have solutions. Solutions we do want to understand because they're a big part of chemistry. Um, solutions, as it says here, are homogeneous mixtures, which just means everything in a solution is mixed very well. Um, there is no clumping um, or irregularities within the solution. So in a solution you have a solvent. This is the liquid, the thing in which the solute will be dissolved. For us, it's pretty much always going to be water because we're talking about your body and water is the solvent that your body uses. And then the solute is whatever is dissolved in the solvent. Again, generally speaking, this is usually a polar molecule dissolved in either water or alcohol. Um, and then benzene and oil, they have different solvent properties. Oil especially is for dissolving things that are non-polar. But we're worried about the polar stuff and watery solutions. So in a watery solution, the solute stays suspended in the solution because it is hydrogen bonded with the solvent solution, so it never floats out. Um, and they're generally small enough that they don't refract a lot of light. So the solution isn't cloudy, although it may be colored. So this is, think, soda, fruit juice, Kool-Aid, um, anything where it's just like sugar and food coloring and stuff dissolved in water, that is a solution. 
Um, when it comes to solutions, it is important to know how much of the solute is in your solvent. So there are different ways of measuring the concentration of solutions. So you can do percent, like percent by weight, or percent by volume, um, or things like uh, just by weight per volume, like milligrams per deciliter, or grams per liter. The preferred method for chemists and biochemists is what is called molarity, or how many moles are in a given liter of solution, how many moles of solute are in a liter of solution. Um, this is important because chemistry takes place in between molecules, and not all compounds have the same molecular weight, right? Water is very small, sugar is much bigger, so a sugar molecule is going to weigh more than a water molecule. And if you just measured the same amount of sugar versus water, you're going to have more sugar water molecules than you would water molecules or salt molecules, anything that's smaller. Um, so if you're doing chemistry and realizing that chemistry takes place in between individual atoms and molecules, then you need to have a measure of how many molecules of a compound are found in a given volume of your solution. And this is where moles come in. The, uh, the history of all this is a little complicated, and I'm not going to go into it. Uh, we will just first define what we now understand a mole to be. Um, one mole of a solute is the molecular weight of that compound in grams. So if the molecular weight of water is 12, then 12 grams of water is a mole of water. Um, and then sometime afterward, somebody came up with the concept of a mole, somebody who is not Avogadro, um, there's a historical reason why Avogadro's number is called Avogadro's number. Um, his work laid the groundwork for understanding moles, but he didn't come up with this calculation. Oh, so somebody later figured out that one mole of any substance, um, is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules of that substance. Um, so that is 6 um, followed by 23 zeros, then an 0, 02. Um, so it is a great big number. We use this shorthand, so if you see glucose in the brackets, that is read as the concentration of glucose in molar. And if we want to say what the concentration of glucose is, we say 5m. So 5m means the concentration is 5 moles per liter or 5 molar solution. Um, so just to show you what this would look like, um, I'm going to use sodium chloride because it's a little easier. Here is our friend sodium. Sodium's atomic weight is 11. Chlorine's atomic weight is 17, so 11 plus 17 equals 28. So a molecule of sodium chloride would be 28 atomic mass units, which means a mole of sodium chloride would be 28 grams. So let's say then you take 28 grams NaCl. Oh, this is fun drawing. Uh, oh, that's supposed to be a beaker. Um, and you put your 25 grams of salt into a beaker, and then that's the one liter mark right there. Then you go back and add enough water to bring you up to one liter of solution. So you have 28 grams, or one mole of salt, in a total of one liter of solution, this would be a one molar sodium chloride solution. Um, that's the way it works, and it is a measure of the number, the actual number of sodium and chloride ions, or sodium chlorine 
sodium chloride molecules that are then going to be dissolved in that solution. Okay, chemical reactions. Uh, so basically the way we think of it is we think of chemistry as running from the right to the left. Whatever is on the right of the arrow we call the reactants. Whatever is on the left of the arrow we call the products. So if you take two hydrogen atoms and put them together to make a molecule of hydrogen gas, the hydrogen atoms are the reactants, the hydrogen gas is then the product, and the same thing down here, four hydrogens plus a carbon make methane, so hydrogen and carbon are your reactants, and then your product would be methane. Oh. Now I had included on the previous slide let me just go back real quick. Double-headed arrows. Um, this picture that I copied from the book um, has a single-headed arrow. I like the double-headed arrows because, as this says here, um, all chemical reactions are theoretically reversible. Um, many bi biological reactions are, as this says here, essentially irreversible um, because the, the energy requirements to reverse them are very hard. Um, so this is basically burning methane. If you burn anything, you're releasing a lot of energy. You have to put all of that energy back into things on this side to get the reaction to run in the other direction. Um, so for many reasons, a lot of your biological reactions favor one, uh, can't speak, uh, one direction over the other. Um, However, they are all theoretically reversible, which is why I prefer the double-headed arrow. This is a reaction which is easily reversible. Um, so carbon dioxide and water get together at some regular rate to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid can also just spontaneously fall back apart into, uh, excuse me, carbon dioxide and water. So if you have water with CO2 in it and you let it sit there long enough, you're going to come to what is called equilibrium, where you have a constant amount of carbonic acid and CO2. So whatever the ratio of this reactant to this product is, it is going to remain stable. But the reaction keeps happening. So there are carbonic acid molecules that are constantly falling apart into CO2 and water, and then CO2 and water molecules that are smashing into each other to make carbonic acid. So we always use the double-headed arrow and understand that the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are always happening, um, and they happen at the same rate at equilibrium. Um, Prior to equilibrium, for different energetic reasons, either the forward reaction or the reverse reaction is going to be favored, and then you get to equilibrium. And that just has to do with stuff that we don't need to get into. It's delta G and entropy and all kinds of stuff from G-chem. Um, so we're going to go over a couple different chemical reactions. There's really only two that I'm going to want you to know. They are the two most important ones, a synthesis and a decomposition reaction that we care about. Um, so first up, um, synthesis reactions in general is just taking small things, linking them together, and making big things. The one synthesis, the specific synthesis reaction that I want you to be familiar with is called dehydration synthesis. Um, so this is where you have two products that are going to give up water um, and then link together to, excuse me, did I say products? Two reactants that are going to lose water and then form a larger product. So over here, um, this is how amino acids are stuck together to make a protein chain. So you have two monomers, like two amino acids. You want to form a bond between them. But in order to form new bonds, you first have to break old bonds. So this monomer here breaks the bond between hydrogen and oxygen there. And then this monomer here breaks the bond between what is essentially a carbon on this monomer with that oxygen. That releases H2O. 
So you're dehydrating your products to synthesize your reactant. Now this oxygen right here ends up forming this bond right there that we just broke um, and you get this dimer. Um, so this might be two sugars that get linked together, um, two monosaccharides that get linked together to make a disaccharide, or this could be two amino acids that get linked together to make a very short peptide called a dipeptide. Um, but this is dehydration synthesis. This is one of the most important anabolic reactions in your body. Anabolic meaning making bigger things. Um, then we move on to hydrolysis, which is essentially the dehydration synthesis reaction run in reverse, because all reactions are theoretically reversible. Now you're using water to lyse or break apart a bigger molecule into two smaller molecules. Um, so anytime you see lysis, something is being broken apart, either a molecule um, or sometimes a cell. Your body has enzymes that lyse or break apart bacteria. So in this case, you've got, right, the, our reactant now is the product that was here before, and we add back water to it, and then you get this hydroxyl group or the OH group here and the hydrogen there. And that water, along with an enzyme, is used to break this bond right here and you get your two monomers back. Um, so if we go way back to water when we were talking about water taking part in your chemistry, the reactivity of water, these are the two central reactions that I would like you to be able to reference when we're talking about um, examples of how water actually takes part in your body's chemistry. Um, exchange reactions, we have a lot of them, we just don't recognize them as being important. But it, it's just, if you look here, you've got A, B plus C, these are your reactants, and then your product is A, C plus B. So something from Actually, yeah, so C has replaced B on A. Um, and a lot of times also what you might see would be, here's another one which I'm going to do just for fun, uh, A, B, oh, lowercase b, that's fine, plus C gives you, I don't have an arrow, so I'm just going to do that, um, A plus B, C. So you've transferred B from A to C. This happens a lot. Um, here in this first one, C has just displaced B on A. But what you see a lot of is something being clipped off of one molecule and then added to another molecule. It's a very common um, exchange reaction is to just tack things onto other things. Uh, then, what are we up to next? Catalysts. Um, so new definition, we're still talking about reactions, but catalysts are compounds or things that take, take part in reactions. Um, as it says right here, a catalyst is something that is going to increase the rate of a chemical reaction without being changed or consumed. So you have A plus B and a catalyst. Um, then you get A, B, and your catalyst back. So the same molecule of catalyst can catalyze multiple rounds of this same synthesis reaction. And you're going to see when we get to later on in the chapter that your body uses proteins as catalysts. These are called enzymes. Um, and they catalyze all the different, or most of the different biochemical reactions that take place in your body. Yeah. And they are sensitive to pH. Um, so we don't really understand what an enzyme is yet, um, but it is a protein that directs your body's chemistry. Um, it is very sensitive to pH. What is pH? I got ahead of myself there. 
Um, it is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. Um, so again, if we think about enzymes, these catalysts that are controlling your body's chemistry, you want to think of the enzymes is like students studying for an exam, and the pH is like the amount of noise in a room. Some students need silence to study, so they go find a quiet corner of the library, um, maybe they sit at home, they close the door, they put their noise-canceling headphones on, and they need silence to concentrate. That is the pH at which they function. Other students, like say myself, um, like to have a little bit of background noise, right? We need a little something to occupy the part of our mind that always wants to wander. Um, I'm more productive sitting in a noisy coffee shop than I am sitting alone in my office where it's quiet. That's my pH. It's just the background noise. Um, so most of us are sensitive to amount, the amount of noise in the room. It affects our productivity. Your body's chemistry is sensitive to pH, or the amount of free hydrogen ions floating around in solution. It just has a big effect on how all kinds of your body's chemistry work. What it is specifically is, are you ready for this? the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration as expressed in moles per liter. What the heck does that mean? Um, so, again, if we're using moles, that's what this means right here. Um, in a pH neutral solution, the number of moles per liter of the mo or the molarity of hydrogen ions in that solution is 0 0.0000001 moles of hydrogen ion in a liter. So one way to express this big number a little smaller is to use what is called scientific notation. So you say that is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. What this means is you take 1 you divide it, that's what the negative is for, by 10 seven times. So then the negative, so this number right here, seven, is the logarithm. So this is a log base 10 scale for those of you that remember your math. Um, so seven is the log, and chemists just, chemists just decided you don't need the negative there because it just confuses things. We just need a measure that we can agree upon. So let's take this number here, drop the negative, and say at a neutral pH, the pH is 7. So this long number became that, which just became that. Um, that is not hugely important that we understand all of that, but there are some important or one very important consequence of that. And what this means is that each pH unit represents a tenfold change in the pH of a solution. Oh, I thought I had made this blank. Blank it out. Uh, so let's say we're going to go up. Where are we? Oh, it doesn't matter what I'm using. Let's say we're doing a pH of 7. All right, so that's 1. And then we're going to divide by 10 seven times. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That gives us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros. All right, so now we put the, what is that called? The decimal point there. So then if we want to do, let's say, pH of, let's go two lower. 5, this is now 1 times 10 to the negative 5. So you're going to go divide by 10 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times. So 0. 0, 0, 0, 0.00001. So here you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros. Here you have 1, 2, 3, 4 zero. So you've moved the decimal point two places. This is 100 times bigger. 
All right, so there's a hundred times more hydrogen ions. A hundred times, yeah, a hundred times more hydrogen ions per liter in a pH five solution versus a pH seven. Right? If you just take this and multiply it times a hundred, you're moving the decimal point one, two, and you get this number down here. Conversely, if you go up to let's say, whoops, this is supposed to be an H a pH of 10, now you're taking one and dividing by 10, or excuse me, taking one, yeah, and dividing by 10, 10 times. Um, so you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and you end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine zeros. Um, so this now has three more zeros than that. Right, this had six, one, two, three, four, five, six. This has nine. So if you go from seven to ten, that's a thousand times less. So this is why your body is so sensitive to pH. Um, so small changes in pH actually mean very big changes in the hydrogen ion concentration. So if we go back to the noise analogy, imagine you're, you're trying to figure out how loud your stereo has to be so that it's loud enough so that you feel like you can concentrate, but not so loud that it's getting in the way of concentrating. And then imagine every time you like hit the volume button by one, it got 10 times louder or 10 times quieter. Um, those would be big changes. Um, so this is important to us to remember this because small changes in pH units actually mean big changes in the concentration of hydrogen ions. Hopefully that was followable. I had fun using my little writing pads, so there. Um, that's mostly why I did it, so I could justify the cost of buying a writing pad. So then what do we want to know? What's sort of our take home? Because I talked a lot here. First, you just want to understand that pH is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. And then here at a pH of 7, that is neutral. Um, and that's all you want to know, that pH 7 is neutral. Then here's where things get tricky. Um, anything below 7 is acidic. And because this number is dividing by, right, when this number gets smaller, the pH gets smaller, you're dividing by 10 fewer times, so the actual concentration goes up. So lower pH, higher hydrogen ion concentration, higher pH, lower hydrogen ion concentration. So if you're above 7, you are basic or alkaline, right? So just had we like we had here if you go from seven to five this number is actually bigger than that number so the lower the ph your, the higher your hydrogen ion concentration the higher the ph the lower your hydrogen ion concentration um, so this is what you want to focus on is the relationship between hydrogen ions and ph and what it means to be an acid versus a base and then if i do give you two pHs, like five versus three, you want to know the fold change that is. So five to three, that's two pH units, so that's a hundredfold difference. Five to four, one pH unit, tenfold difference. Um, let's see, this, this is not all that important, but it's kind of fun just to see the basic pH of different things. Um, here, lemon juice all the way down here at a pH of 2. Um, that's also the pH of your stomach acid. So your stomach is basically a pit of acid, which kills a lot of things that end up in it. Um, so what else do we have here? Here's blood at 7.4. So your normal um, blood pH at which your body is considered happy is 7.35 to 7.45. Um, if you get up to 7.47, down to 7.32, your body becomes unhappy. Um, so that's it, 39 minutes. Um, then you should have a different screencast for macromolecules, which you want to remember to watch that screencast before you do the macromolecules homework assignment.
Thanks for listening this long.